and welcome to the December 1st-ish edition of According to Pete. In case you hadn't noticed, we, we very uh, slyly went back to once a month without an official notice. With the other guys doing all their videos and stuff, and they're getting pretty good responses, I really don't need to be out in front of everybody every two weeks. So what are we going to talk about today? There was a question in the queue about um, a little bit more elaborate op-amp design. And the original op-amp episode about a year and a half ago got a pretty good response. So I thought I would spend some time doing that. Specifically, the question was about um, designing a single-ended um, preamp using op amps. A preamplifier is uh, a place where you do uh, signal conditioning or processing before final power amplification or voltage amplification as the case may be. In terms of audio, uh, which is primarily what I'm approaching here, uh, it'll be the place where you do equalization, right? You get like a 10 band EQ or something. In the case of uh, say guitar effects, <laughs> which I like, it'll be the place where you do uh, like distortion or a chorus effect or a flanger effect or any of that stuff. Because it's pre-amplifying, you don't actually have to have a power section at the end of this. It's line level in, and line level out. And you don't really need a uh, high gain unless you're doing a guitar effect or something like that. The question specifically said single-ended. What's single-ended? It is where you are driving with a single signal line instead of like a bridged output or something. We'll talk about that as we go. Now, when I get done with the example circuit, we're gonna talk about component choices, which ones are good, which ones are bad. Crazy talk on the internet about component choices and various audio topics and I got a bunch of links I'm going to post too. But first let's start with an example circuit. If you've watched the first episode, which was a year and a half ago, a lot of this will look very familiar to you. We'll assume this is the input stage to your pre-amplifier. You, you've got a signal in here and you'll have like an RCA or whatever, right? So it's got a signal in the middle and it's got a ground, right? At the very first you want to do um, a level in pot. I usually stick with like 10k. Uh, I might go 50k, but 100k is fine. And the reason for this is um, you don't know what's coming in here. So you want to keep this value high enough that you don't tax whatever's out there. You don't want to draw too much current because you don't know how much driving capability it's got. Second thing you want is to put a cap here. You want to AC couple this thing. You don't know if there's any DC offset out here. There probably isn't, all right? The, the previous stage, previous whatever, is probably already AC coupled, but you can't depend on it. And you're gonna calculate that value according to these resistors, and we'll get to that in a second. This is just um, a single-ended, single-supply uh, inverting amplifier. Gain of one. You could adjust this for different applications. A lot of the examples that I saw when doing some research on this showed a gain of one. I mean, basically, a preamp is line in, line out. It's less than a volt, peak to peak, generally. If you're running a V plus here of five volts or nine volts in the case of uh, a, a stomp box for a guitar, uh, you should be just fine. And if you remember the uh, the equation for an inverting amplifier, uh, the gain AB is R2 over R1. In this case, I chose a pair of 10Ks. 10Ks are good because if you remember um, the input impedance of these guys, it's very high. It's like in the hundreds of K to mega ohms. You want the resistors to do the thing you want them to do, right? So in the case of here, I'm setting up my reference voltage. And if you remember the design, this voltage will appear at the output, right? This is how, by setting this on the non-inverting input, you basically set half of V plus, whatever V plus is, to the output. You wanna be able to set the reference, but you don't want them to be interfered with by this input impedance. And since these are so much lower than this one, no trouble. If I made these values like 10 meg, or something crazy big like that, then suddenly the input impedance here comes into the equation, and I don't just have you know, V ref equals these two resistors, it's gonna incorporate this one. And you don't want that. Same thing for the gain. You don't want this input impedance to come into the equation. So you choose values that are much lower, like an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude lower. We have capacitors to worry about. I've set up my reference here, so I got this. The first thing I'm gonna worry about is coupling in the signal. A trick I use to evaluate um, frequency response of circuits, what you do is you evaluate the circuit um, you know, off the cuff at zero hertz, which is to say DC, and infinite hertz, which is, you know, high, high frequency. At a really low frequency, 
nothing's going to get through, okay? At a very high frequency, everything's going to get through. Huh, okay. So this is a high pass filter basically, along with this guy. Remember this equation? We've looked at this one a few times. Uh, the value of that capacitor is going to be 2 pi fr, you know, 1 over 2 pi fr. The resistor in question is this guy. Since it's a high pass thing here, you want to calculate this against a frequency which is low. You want the lowest possible frequency. So I calculated a value of 1.59 microfarad based on 10 hertz. You put in 10 here and you put in 10k here and out pops 1.59 microfarad. I don't remember the last time I saw 1.59 microfarad cap, but that's all right. I mean, this is like my minimum value. From there, I can just go up. And quite honestly, I would throw 100 microfarad electrolytic at that and I'd forget about it because at that value, it's gonna let everything through and I'm not gonna have to worry about it. Reference voltage. This is going to be half of V plus and that's going to set the output level. You want the reference voltage to be as quiet as possible. Again, you're gonna want a cap here and you're going to want to calculate it against that 10K resistor. So it ends up being exactly the same equation and out dumps 1.59 microfarad for 10 Hertz. I'll probably just throw a hundred microfarad in there. Maybe a 10, nah, probably a hundred. Um, and then I'll forget about it. If you remember from the previous uh, op amp episode, you want to roll off the uh, gain frequency at at some place that's sane. Because if you don't, this sucker can start oscillating. Nobody likes that. And so this equation changes just a bit, right? It's the same equation, but instead of calculating for the lowest frequency, you're calculating for the highest. Instead of 10 hertz there, I calculated for 100 kilohertz. And that's where the frequency will start to roll off. If you think about this in terms of highest frequency passed and lowest frequency passed, right? That how to evaluate this at very low frequencies, this becomes an open. And so the gain equation is just R2 over R1. At arbitrarily high frequencies, everything goes feedback through that cap. The cutoff frequency is 100 kilohertz and that's the value, 159 picofarad. Now this one's a little more critical to calculate than these two guys, right? This is like, you know, minimum value to get the lowest frequency. You can't make this an arbitrarily high thing. The higher this value is, the more that roll off is gonna come down into your listening spectrum. You're just trying to get rid of high frequency oscillations. I chose 100 kilohertz, 159 picofarad. Uh, for a practical application, I might go, what, 180 picofarad, maybe a 220? Eh, it's in that ballpark. The whole point of this is just to isolate what's out there from what's going on in there. This op amp, ideally uh, zero output impedance, so I can drive anything. I'm not gonna have to drive anything because the next few stages of whatever are gonna be more op amps and they're gonna be a high input impedance. The output stage, the output stage, is actually gonna be really, really similar to this. In fact, I'm probably still gonna have this here because I wanna be able to set my output level. I'm not really sure what's gonna be out here. So I'm gonna to want to adjust that. Calculating these values ends up being just about exactly the same, except that I might set this up for a little bit of gain, like maybe a gain of two, maybe three, mm, probably two, right? Cause I don't want too much coming out. Um, but instead of 10K, I might do like a 27K or something to give you a gain of 2.7, just so that I have the ability to push whatever it is out here. Since this is going to have a DC offset, you're going to need to AC couple this to whatever. Now, what is that value? Keep in mind that whatever's out here is, is the input stage to a larger amplifier or more signal processing or something. So this is going to have a very high input impedance out here. You would calculate this cap value according to what that input impedance is, and you're going to calculate it for the lowest possible frequency of interest, just like this coupling cap here. As an example, I calculated this out with uh, stereo headphones, right? My headphones that I've got are like 600 ohms. So if you calculate with that, equation 600 ohms at 50 hertz, you come up with a value of 5.3 microfarad. This puts your low frequency roll off at 50 hertz. 
if you're driving 600 ohms. We're not driving 600 ohms. We're driving something probably a lot more. Nevertheless, I will probably just throw down 100 microfarad right there. When you're putting this on a PCB, whether you're building it by hand with through-hole components or you're laying out a PCB or such, the biggest rule of thumb I can tell you when working with op amps is keep the lead lengths as short as you can. Not so much the ones out here, that's not a big deal. Not so much the ones out here, but like that guy, right off the pins of the op amp, these are the high gain spots. The longer these leads are, the more antenna-like they become. You're not gonna set it up for like, well, if I can't have my lead lengths less than two millimeter, I'm not going to do it. No, forget that. You gotta remember, this is probabilistic. The longer these are, the more likely it is you're gonna pick up noise. The shorter they are, the less likely. You're just gonna make them as short as you can, right? I mean, don't be stupid. Don't be stringing this stuff from one circuit board to another. That's, that's crazy talk. Um, but as long as you keep the components close to here, and you know, through hole components, they're fine. The leads are gonna be a little long. It's not a big deal. If you're really concerned about it, you could lay down a soic part on a little, you know, surface mount PCB, and you could put NO603 right between the pins, and that'll minimize it. Another thing I might consider is instead of setting up a resistor divider for my reference, I might actually use a voltage regulator. Is it critical? No, it's not really critical, um, but it'll probably be a little bit quieter than this, and you do want your stuff quiet. Why don't we talk about the actual component constructions and what sort of components you may or may not want. Wow, there is a lot of wacky, wacky talk out there about um, component construction and the best ones for high fidelity audio. Let's talk about resistors first. There's carbon, there's thin film, thick film, metal foil, there's wire wound. Why do you care about those compositions? Just by passing a current through a resistor, you create noise. The best resistors in terms of the quietest resistors are um, metal foil, seemingly metal foil resistors and um, wire wound. I would never use these. Metal foil resistors uh, tend to be expensive. The values are wacky, right? They don't, there's not like the, the rainbow of flavors that you can get with your average carbon resistor. Um, they're used for sort of specific applications uh, that seems to be sensing and stuff. I've never used one. And based on the prices I saw, I'm never going to use one. But they would perform well in this application if it meant that much to you. So what would I use? Well, I would probably not use carbon resistors because they tend to be more noisy. The ones that look like a fairly decent compromise are the thin film uh, resistors. They're cheap, they're plentiful, they come in a ton of packages and they are on average quieter than carbons and, and a few others. Now, let's talk about capacitors. The lowly capacitor in its natural habitat. That is an ideal capacitor. That is not what truly exists in the real world. What exists in the real world is this. This is the capacitance value. This is the leakage current. This is the equivalent series resistance. And this is um, series inductance. Now a great deal of um, discourse has occurred with regard to the best capacitors for audio applications. It's crazy. I'm not going to get into specifically uh, which capacitor chemistries are the best for any given application. What I'm going to do is tell you what you want. You assume you have this value. You want this to be as close to, and if they, and the spec in the data sheet is going to say like leakage current X, you want the leakage current to be zero, which implies that you want this model resistor to be infinite, okay? You don't want a resistor there, so you want that to be an open. This guy, series resistance, um, this is ESR, you want that to be zero. It'll never be zero, but that's what you want. That's what you're shooting for. This guy, same thing. You don't want inductance in here, so you want that to be zero. So when you're shopping for capacitors, you're looking for data sheets that tell you the lowest values. Electrolytic caps are known for being not the greatest, uh, especially with regard to ESR. That said, uh, you know, you go shopping on Digikey and you can find electrolytic caps that are, you know, their ESR is in, you know, approximately 100s 
of milli ohm. That's not an ohm. That's an omega. And that's fine, especially for our circuit, what we were doing. That value of ESR uh, doesn't really pose that much of a problem for your circuit because all the other impedances around it are like in the tens of K. You're like three, four orders of magnitude below that. So you probably don't need to worry about it too much. If you are concerned about it, you can take every place that you put an electrolytic cap and you can bypass that with another capacitor that has a lower ESR, okay, for a better high frequency response. If I'm buying a cap that's got that low of an ESR, I'm not gonna sweat it. That's pretty good. Even if I'm driving, you know, a, a speaker, that's not that bad. In my notes it says, you know, draw a model and cop out. Uh, because it's just, there's hate, there's hate. People go at each other with knives when they talk about this stuff. So let's say, You've built your piece of audio gear and you're really proud of it. You want to test it. How do you test it? The things you're interested in, frequency response, you're going to want to know about signal to noise ratio, SNR. You're probably going to want to know about total harmonic distortion. These are all things that kind of uh, uh, specify how good of a circuit you've made, how quiet it is, how well it passes frequency, what kind of garbage it puts into it. Test gear to test this stuff is crazy expensive, even the used stuff. I went shopping, right? And um, even the used gear, call for pricing. You know what, if you have to call for pricing, you shouldn't be asking the question. Back in the day, I used to use stuff from a company called Audio Precision, and their gear will typically range anywhere from like seven, eight grand to 20,000 plus. What are the odds that the average guy is gonna be able to test this stuff? Not very much. I'm not buying any of this gear, but I will buy, I will build audio circuits. So how will I compromise? I will trust my ears, right? I know what sounds good. I, I can hear, I know what I like, and, and that's probably good enough. Getting frequency response is not as difficult as the other two. A good oscilloscope will usually give you, you know, an FFT of the frequency spectrum. These guys, a little harder. You might have to look at a scope and be tricky or something. You might even develop your own test gear or method of testing this stuff. As you may have noticed, I um, very conspicuously did not talk about the magic sauce that happens between the input section and the output section. That particular portion is very application specific. This is where the signal conditioning happens and it depends on what you want to do. For my own purposes, I spent some time, you know, digging into like, uh, guitar stomp boxes and, and that associated circuitry. And a lot of it is pretty easy to do. So I'm thinking, you know, I went downstairs and I got one of these and I got one of these and I got a bag of these and Christmas vacation's coming up and I'm gonna build something. For our purposes, um, I would like to ask the masses if you would like to see any more of what happens in the middle. Maybe specifically uh, filters. You guys who already know filter design, and I'm sure there's a lot of you out there, um, how is he going to explain poles and zeros? How is he going to explain? I don't know. I don't know. If you have a desire for me to explain that or watch me trip over my words with regard to frequency response and uh, filter design, say so in the comment section. Um, no promises, but I'll try to give it a whack. Or if there's anything else with regard to op amps that you want to hear about, uh, post it in the comments. Uh, if, if other people see people requesting stuff, upvote it or, or what have you, and that'll give me an idea where to go with this. Thanks for watching. Again, keep the uh, questions coming. You can send them to feedback at sparkfun.com with according to Pete in the subject line, or you can post your questions in the comment section below. Thank you, and I'll see you in a month.